guys, thank you for joining me on Their Fight Story. I have Carrick with us. How are you doing today, Carrick? I am doing just fine, or at least as fine as anybody could be in 2020. <laughs> Very good point. Um, how did you start in MMA? I started in MMA, well, I was 13 years old, and I was living in a little country in uh, southern Africa called Lesotho. It had two movie theaters, and at one of the two movie theaters, they were playing a movie. And I walked there, it was like a two-mile walk, and it was a Bruce Lee movie. And I was like, oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. I don't want to do anything for the rest of my life but that. So when I was 13, I was like, all right, all I want to do is martial arts. Uh, when I was, let's see, I got out of high school at 16, took a year off. So now I'm 21, graduated from college. I bought into a local martial arts studio um, and we built that up, did reasonably well with it. And then in 93, uh, we got a, um, we got a, a thing in the mail saying, hey, do you want to enter this, this fight? And I was like... I'd sort of seen things like it before. They had one in Taunton. They had uh, they had one in New York. They had one in Hawaii. These kind of no-holds-barred things. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. I might get hurt. But I was a little bit interested in it when we got that invite. And then I started reading articles that there was this UFC thing coming out. Uh, so all of us got together at a friend's condo, maybe 30, 40 of us, somewhere in there. And uh, we watched UFC 1. And... I, I, I thought it might have been faked until they said John McCarthy goes, ready, go. And uh, Gerard Gordeaux runs across the ring, knocks down Taylor Tooley, kicks his tooth. Taylor Tooley's tooth goes tearing out of the cage and into the audience. And I was like, oh, my God, this is actually real. So that was the, uh, that was the, that was the start of my interest in MMA. <laughs> so what was your first fight? Uh, first time, I, I didn't compete much. The first time, I don't remember the first time I actually went to a fight. The first time I fought was, I don't know, sometime probably late 90s. Yeah, or yeah, late, 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 late 90s or early 2000s, somewhere in there. Uh, the sport had evolved quite a bit, but it, it's not. It's not close to what it. Uh, it's not close to what it is now. The level of athletes now is is just hugely better than it was. Like I see amateurs now who are good. Like they can fight. They can take a shot. They're highly conditioned. They're highly skilled. Um, it, it's 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 been a very impressive change. And I, I if somebody said to me, "What's the biggest change in mixed martial arts in the last whatever twenty years?" I think the number one thing. It's undeniable. The number one thing is the growth of the UFC. But the number two thing is the rise in amateur mixed martial arts. Uh, it, it's really been awesome for me to see a now worldwide movement in people competing at the amateur level under somewhat safer, uh, under somewhat safer rules. Now, I also see that you are an author of the Fighter's Notebook. Uh, yeah, I've written a few. <laughs> that's kind of a weird story. I've written a few books on MMA. Um, that book, I believe, was the first book ever on MMA, and it all started because I hide my own Easter eggs. I cannot remember anything <laughs> in life. So we were driving down to Henzo Gracie's every Friday. It's like a three-and-a-half-hour uh, drive, getting a private lesson from him. We were going to seminars. We were trying to figure it out from, from tapes. We're trying to figure this whole thing out, but my mind doesn't retain anything. So I started taking notes and I took really detailed notes so I could remember anything. How to do an arm bar, how to take five pages of notes. And then for work at my gym, uh, we bought a Mac SE computer and you could digitize video from it. Somebody, some kid explained it to me. This is S video in. It's like video. You can put it in. And I had some videotapes and I'm like, you know what? I remember that I would remember this stuff better if it had pictures to go along with my words. So I would take a videotape and do a screen capture and put it into my notes. And after doing that for a year or something, I was like, you know, I think these notes could be a book. So I reached out to uh, Henzo and I was like, hey, because he had an 11 tape set that I had 
I had transcribed the entire thing. I'd transcribed every technique. I'd put six pictures for each one. And I was like, Kenzo, you know, I, I love your tapes and I made this book. And how about if we just trade, you can have the book and I can have free private lessons or something. And he goes, ah, the book looks really good, but I'm not the business guy. Craig Kukuk is a business guy. Go talk to him. Kukuk wasn't interested. So I'm like, all right, I'll do it myself. But I didn't want to plagiarize any of their moves. So I had to change. I had to find new moves. Yes. Um, that took about a year. So in 98, I released the Fighter's Notebook. It had uh, about 600 pages, um, 300,000 words. It was bit For the time, it was pretty comprehensive. Every single thing in there is wrong now. Anything anybody <laughs> sees in there, it's wrong. <laughs> but at the time, it was, it, was, it was pretty comprehensive. But then I didn't really have any way to market it. So I went on the Internet. And I grabbed a few URLs like mixedmartialarts.com. Nobody even thought to grab that. Yeah. Uh, we didn't even end up using that one. We used uh, submissionfighting.com. But then my mother said, honey, some of my friends, when I tell them submission fighting, think it's something really weird. And I was like, all right, mom. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. <laughs> so went to MMA TV and uh, eventually back to mixedmartialarts.com we have now. But anyways, I, I grabbed a bunch of URLs and uh, I built a website just to try and let people know the book was out there. Mm -hmm. um, and then almost as an afterthought, we had a, we added a, uh, like a chat form, a message mm -hmm. board to the site. And the message board ended up being what the, the most popular thing was. I didn't anticipate it. It all actually argued against it. Uh, but really? that's how the book led me to the internet. Yeah. So if you wouldn't have done your book, you wouldn't have done MMA TV or is that something you would have eventually? I, I would have eventually done it because I, I think, because I had a, I had a function. It was, it was like Tinder, but for guys that wanted to fight, because that wanted to fight. Because now you can get an amateur fight. You know, you go to your coach, like, hey, coach, you want to fight? You train for a couple of years and you fight. Boom, it's done. But there were no fights then. Yeah. Guys around here in New England were going down to like Virginia if they wanted to have a fight. And so this is long pre Tinder, but I was like, you know, it, it's what Tinder was. People want to date, and so it connects them. People want to fight, it connects them. Um, and we, I actually did launch it. It ended up being a little bit popular, but not real popular. Uh, but I would have eventually done that, even if I hadn't had the book that I wanted to market. But I never would have had a message board because uh, there was a, a website then called Defend.net, run by a guy from down in Texas named Tim Mussel. And he had a message board, and I loved that message board. I like, didn't want to have another one because I liked his. So I, I wouldn't have done that, but I would have I would have had a website of some sort with a with a fight finder on it, or I don't want to call it a fight finder because that steals some sure dog. A fights finder, so you can fight somebody to find somebody to fight. <laughs> now your MMA TV, I mean MMA TV. What does it cover? So if people are going on it for the first time, what are, what is it? The, the website is a couple of different, it, it has a couple of different parts. Um, the, the, oh, historically, the most popular part of it has always been the message boards. Mm -hmm. um, we've got about 10 different message boards. You can talk about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you can talk about mixed martial arts. You can, we've got the most popular part, which is a little ironic, because I try to stop it for so many years, is where people talk about anything but fighting. It's a forum called Other Brown, where you're not allowed to talk about fighting. So it's, it's forbidden. So they talk about life and cigars and whiskey and the president and whatever they want to talk about. So you can talk about fighting and you can talk about not fighting on the site. Uh, we've also got a, uh, a database of all the fights in the sports history. Uh, 11 years ago, there was a request for proposal from the Association of Boxing Commissions for a, um, a, uh, a records keeper for MMA. Mm -hmm. There's a federal law, the Muhammad Ali Act, that mandates that a body be established, the Association of Boxing Commissions, to regulate boxing and that they maintain records of wins, losses, and suspensions. Mm -hmm. So you can't get knocked out in Massachusetts and then get suspended for 90 days and then fight New Hampshire the next weekend and so on and so on until you're all abada babada. So they applied the spirit of that law to mixed martial arts 
called for an MMA records keeper. I was honored to be selected as, uh, as such. And so we have a big database on the site of all the fights in, uh, in the sports history too. And then a third, I would say a third part of the site is we have a bunch of uh, uh, content for more popular consumption. Just like, oh my God, here's a guy using Taekwondo on the street to jump kick somebody and, and that sort of thing. I'd say those are the, those are the, the, the three most, most popular. And, and I guess I would add a fourth one. On our front page, we curate all the news in the sport or what we think is the most compelling news in the sport. So if somebody on the forum talks about a news item and people are really excited about it, we put that on the front there. Um, and if nobody's talking about it yet, I try and beat them to it and throw up news about it. So we, we, got a, we have a news page too. What do people, if, if people are looking to fight or find information on the fighters, when they click on it, they'll have all of their their information and it's just for professionals or amateurs as well? Uh, it's a database of all amateur and professional fights. There's actually more amateur fights than professional fights in America, although the lines get a little blurred here for, uh, from time to time. Uh, but it has a complete fight record of all of the, uh, all the amateurs, all the pros. Uh, and it, it shows if they have been, sus if they're under suspension, it shows in yellow that they're suspended. <coughs> Excuse me. But the details as to why they were suspended are, are proprietary and only, mm -hmm. um, only seen by, by state, provincial, tribal, and municipal athletic, government athletic uh, commission staff. And how quickly is that updated? Uh, on a constant basis. Uh, we've got one full-time uh, person who does, who enters stuff around the clock. We've got one guy part-time, was real smart, two master's degrees, one business, one, uh, one in computer science. And then Chris and I work on it part-time as well. So it, it's, it's every, every 20 minutes or something, something new goes oh, in. Wow. So that's like the place to go to find the most updated information? Um, I wouldn't want to toot my own horn. Um, SureDog has a really good. <laughs> SureDog has a really good database. Tapology.com has a really good database, and we have a really good uh, database. And uh, I consider the people that run uh, Tapology and, and SureDog to be colleagues, and they're doing a great job. And I, and I hope they feel the same way too. So there's three good databases for MMA that people can reach out to: ours, Tapologies, and SureDogs. Now you, um, I saw that you are involved in everything MMA except being a ring card girl would you consider <laughs> would you consider being a male card girl I mean a male uh, um, a person? ring card a ring card boy yes. sure I would be a ring card boy although I have been beaten to it the first guy to do it is one of the historically speaking pillars of mixed martial arts uh hook and shoot founder jeff osborne he was the first guy to do it oh. hats off to him the second one was elias theodoro um no disrespect to jeff but elias is a lot better looking than jeff and i are so i i think elias is really the man who's He's our Ariane Celeste. He's the, he's the best at uh, male ring card boying. And he did it for Invicta FC, which is an all-women's card, which I thought was great. I, I just like the idea of having a guy ring card guy at an all-women's fight. Uh, so big credit to him for that. But, yes, if there was an ever, an, ever an opportunity to be a ring card boy, I'm first in line. <laughs> I have a few people that are looking, so I will definitely give you the information so you can get on that. <laughs> so you can add to your resume since that's the one thing you haven't done <laughs> ring car boy I, I actually that reminds me I was refing in Hawaii once and we went to a luau with 10,000 people and they said a woman came out and she goes we need some volunteers and everybody's like for what and they said for a luau dance contest and I was like sure so I'm like, I'll learn how to luau dance or hula dance. <laughs> so there was three of us. They chose three guys. I won two other guys. So I'm a little nervous now. There's 2,000 people there. 
This lady grabs me, goes, come in the back, come in the back, come in the back. She goes, take your pants off, take your pants off. I'm like, what the hell? Take your shirt off. I'm like, Whoa. all right. So I'm in my underwear. She puts a hula skirt on me and then a coconut bra, a coconut shell bra. And I went out there. She, she taught me like two steps of the hula. And I went out there and we had a contest with those two other guys. I got second out of three, so it, it could have been worse. So I, I, I do have some relevant ring card boy experience. Wow. I was the second, I was the second place in a hula contest in Hawaii. <laughs> True story. <laughs> but now you can give classes on how to hula dance too. <laughs> but what? Not everybody can do that. <laughs> I'm a trained professional. Look at that in all aspects. <laughs> yeah, you're also um, commentating on fights. Is, is there any um, fighter that the fans should be looking out for? Well, I said, um, I said about a year ago, I, 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 I knew who he was. I'd researched him. I'm like, this guy looks like he's, he's undefeated. He looks like he's really good. And when I finally got to see him in person, he touched the guy with an uppercut, knocked him out cold, just out, out cold. My two, the two guys I was broadcasting with stand up screaming, ah! I'm just shock silent. And when I finally was able to say something, I said, I, be I said, gentlemen, I believe we have seen the future of mixed martial arts and his name is Hamzat Shemaev. And I said that like a year and a half ago. And now uh, he's entered the UFC and everybody's like, wow, this guy is, uh, this guy is, is, is something else. Um, unfortunately, Fortunately, right now, I am stuck in the United States of America. So I've missed shows in, in uh, Romania, Sweden, Poland, China, and Bahrain, as far as I know. So I, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't have that like face-to-face -face connection with the fighters where you, you, you watch them you watch them with their camp and you interview them in person and then you watch them fight in the ring. Cause sometimes people on the mitts look incredible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people have a great record, but when they actually get out there in a big show with a global audience, they kind of melt. Um, and sometimes people look spectacular, but when you're sitting there six feet away from them, it's maybe not as spectacular and vice versa. There's been fights where I watched really close and I'm like, oh my God, it's one of the best fights I've ever seen. But when you see it on tape, it's not nearly, uh, it's not nearly so good. Yeah. So my experience right now um, is at a distance and it, it doesn't give me that same, uh, that same insight that I, that I would ordinarily have if I'd been calling fights, I'd say. The way you view that, do you see that as well as the judges? Because you know how a lot of people um, always comment on, oh, you know, what was this judge looking at and stuff like that. Do you feel that being up close to the cage, is you get a different perspective as far as when people are actually looking? That is probably the best question anybody has asked me this year uh, because judging is a huge point of contention in this sport. I, I think that some criticism of judging is warranted. Um, I think criticism makes things get better, and it, that's super important. But there's a lot of fundamental things that a lot of the critics, including a lot of the critics in the media, don't aren't aware of. Mm -hmm. One of them is judges can only call what they see. When you watch on TV, there's three, four camera mm -hmm. angles, and they edit them so you can see what's going on. Even as a referee, I've refereed hundreds of fights. As a referee, I can run. I can go wherever I want, and I still sometimes miss critical action. A guy's got a, a far side one-on-one, -on -one and he's throwing punches, and I'm here. I can't see how well the guy is, mm -hmm. is defending. And so I, I, it takes me a split second to run around and see. Judges are stuck in the seat, and they only have available to them what they can see. They, can, they can't call what they think happened. They can only call the fight as they see it. And that's why very often 
you'll have two judges scoring a fight in different ways. Mm -hmm. It's not that one of them's not good. It's not that one of them's bad. It's that they're seeing a different fight because they can't walk around. They don't have three camera angles. So in a close fight, maybe they, one of them saw a submission attempt that the other one just wasn't in position good enough to see. So, uh, so yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I think that judges get criticized way too much by fans that don't understand what's going on, uh, what's going on out there. And I think fans don't understand themselves. And I know this about myself. I will sit down and decide to watch a fight as a fan or as a judge. Mm -hmm. And your eyes are, your, your eyes are physically in different places. When you judge, you, you try and keep your eyes equidistant between the two fighters. So you can watch the interaction between them. When you're a fan, all my eyes are going to be on the fighter that I like more. Mm -hmm. And if I know that fighter really well and I understand their style, I can tell what they're trying to do. And so, of course, I think they're winning. I understand what they're trying to do. My eyes are on them the whole time. Sure, I think. And then some judge is like, nah, it was 10 9 the other way. And I'm like, that judge is an idiot. He doesn't know anything. Get rid of him. Boo, hang him from the highest yard arm. Uh, and, and that I don't like because. Being a judge is really, really thankless in MMA. Yeah. It's really thankless. They do not get compensated well. Uh, it really is truly a labor of love. And I, I, I think judges in MMA are, are, are do way more are do way more respect than that is extended to them for most quarters. I agree. I agree. I see it a lot when I'm when I'm even like when I'm doing my pictures and I have to be a certain distance from the judge what's the point of me taking the picture? And I just totally blocked the view of the judge. Now the judge can't. So I'm always being cautious of my distance. And I'm always asking, you know, am I in your way? Am I not in your way? Like, just let me know. Cause I don't need them to be doing more work than they have to. Cause now they're taking time away from crap. Is she going to elbow me? Is she going to, you know what I mean? So now, yeah. it, you know what I mean? So I'd rather be moving a little bit over. Maybe I missed a shot. That's okay. But at least you get scored the right way and there's no issue, you know? Or even like we were at one of the fights and one of the, uh, one of the fighters, you know, uh, pushed, it was, a, it was a boxing match actually. And the guy flipped over the, the ring, you know, the ropes, he flipped over and psh, I'm not taking the shot. I backed up. I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm good. But the guy fell on top of the judge, you know what I mean? So now the judge fell back. So it's like, people don't, see everything that they because I, I can back up they really can't back up too yeah. much because then they miss the whole thing but it's like they get injured too um so it's something that you know I wish people are more aware of hopefully they will be but yeah one of the them. more dramatic things and I'm sure I guarantee you it's happened to you one of the more dramatic things that happens in the sport when you get if you're calling the fights if you're judging refereeing if you're doing media you get blood on you oh people yes leave it but it, but like it's not uncommon for somebody to catch a big elbow and then boop, there's blood all over and you're like oh my god this is real oh my gosh yes i that happened to me at world series of fighting and it was the two heavyweights and i was just like honestly that was like the very first amazing heavyweight fight i had ever seen in my entire life because honestly sometimes i see their fights and they're kind of like One's running this way and other one's running that way, or they're too tired. And I'm just like, then why are you in the ring? Like, why are you in the cage? Like, you shouldn't be here. But they went at it. And I was just like, oh crap. And it was just like, they opened up a faucet and it was just like blood gushing. And I was like, oh my God. And then it's like, we were all covered. The judges were covered. I was covered. I'm like, can we get an umbrella or something? You know, because this is like, it, yeah, it was like, it was a bloodbath. I mean, and I normally don't like the blood, but it was like an intense, amazing fight that they were both like boom, 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 like choking, slamming. Take, yeah, I was just like, whoa. So yeah, it was, it was a good fight. It was a lot of blood, but it was definitely good. And, I, and it was impressive for the heavyweights because sometimes I get disappointed on the heavyweights. Um, 
Yeah, heavyweight is not the deepest division in, in mixed martial arts, to uh, to say the least. And yeah. super heavyweight is very nearly non-existent. Getting back to blood, I think my 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 worst or best blood story was I ref probably like 13, 14 fights in a row. They weren't particularly bloody, but it was like it's MMA. And then I got back to my hotel room and I took my wrestling shoes off and my 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 socks were red, soaked red. Oh. There was some blood getting all over my wrestling shoes and through. I was just like, oh, this is a tough sport. I need to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, it is. Now, when you did refing, did you ever um, get taken down by accident? Because, you know, the fighter was so into it. Because I've been at a fight where a fighter just wasn't really seeing what was going on and didn't notice that the ref was actually separating them. And he went in and, like, was choking the ref. And it was just like, <laughs> what's going on? I had any number of fights where guys would get uh, knocked out. No, never mm -hmm. knocked out, but they would get choked out. I was just trying to remember. And then you stop the fight. They get triangled or whatever. Get, they get thrown on their back. And when they come to, because they're warriors, yeah. they're like, I'm still in the fight. Boom, I don't know what happened. And there's a guy in front of me. It's probably him. And so, yeah, more than a few times, you've had to just kind of grab guys' arms and try and talk to them. And by then, their corner is in there, and everybody calms them down. Uh, yeah, and then once, it was exciting. <laughs> So I'm like, you ready to fight? You ready to fight? Fight. Two, three, four, knockout. Yeah. Boom. Five second knockout. And the guy, I think he knocked him out with a kick and then he's following up with punches. And he was so intent that I get in there going break, break, break. And he, he kept punching and kept punching. And kind of, I get thrown back and I'm like, oh my God, this guy's going to kick my ass. And so I tried one more time and I managed to push him off. He probably like, came to, he was just highly adrenalized. It happens. Um, but yeah, I did have a time where literally I had this like split second thing. Like I can't beat this guy. He was way, he was like a welterweight, but I knew I couldn't. He's a beast. I'm like, God, what do I do if he like keeps fighting me? Like, <laughs> Help. Which way do I go? <laughs> but luckily, the second time he moved back and everything was fine. Um, and he's a really good guy. <laughs> that is, awesome. you know, was wasn't personal. It was just uh, it's an intense sport, and uh, he got uh, he got lost in an intense moment. And you know what? Um, that split second could determine the whole fight if it wasn't you and it was his other opponent. You know what I mean? Because some people, I've seen fights where the. Um, like corner the, the red corner is like striking 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 and, and the guy drops and he backs off but he could have just finished him right there and you know what I mean like he gave him a chance or vice versa like so I mean that could determine everything either the guy gets knocked out or now you think you're backing up to give him space but now he's gonna knock you out with a kick or something or whatever my very first MMA bout I refed ever it was like late 90s. I had ref thousands of grappling matches. A promoter named Jamie Levine saw me ref and he goes, hey, you should ref MMA. I'm like, all right, invite me. And so we did. It was in West Virginia. We drove down to West Virginia. <clears throat> they got to understand my background in, 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 in refing had been grappling. So you ready to fight? You ready to fight? Fight. Guy comes out, smacks the other guy hard. The other guy falls on the ground. What do I do? I just stop the fight because I'm like, he's hurt. <laughs> And then I realized something's wrong. The kid who had, who had gotten knocked down jumps up, and he's like, what are you doing? And the, the, uh, the promoter is screaming at me, just screaming, what are you doing? And I'm, like, looking around, and, like, 15 seconds pass, and I realize this is pre-regulation days. I'm like, I can do whatever I want. So I'm like, okay, you ready? Ready? Keep fighting. I had already stopped the fight. But it was a mistake. So and in the end, the same guy that got the knockdown ended up winning the fight. Oh, yeah, Mark Coleman was in the guy's corner. So I got Jamie Levine screaming his head off at me. Mark Coleman ready to rip my head off. The guy who got knocked down going, what are you doing? I'm fine. So, yes, absolutely, let him fight. It's a fight. <laughs> Do you have any pictures or footage that we can review? I don't – that fight – went was live in brazil but i don't think it was ever broadcast in the u.s i, I could probably find it i could probably find it oh that would be nice that one and also um, 
You need, also need to get us the, the Hawaiian luau thing. My best friend Kip Kolar has that. <laughs> Kip has, <laughs> you need to get that. <laughs> he's got footage of me coming in second place wearing a hula so skirt. So he was with you? Was he the other hula guy? No, no. He, no, he's Kip Smart. I'm the stupid one. He's the one that got me to go up there <laughs> so he could have a laugh. The other two are some college kids or something. That's priceless. Oh, my goodness. Um, do you have any plans for your birthday? Uh, birthday's coming up. Yes, I am going to, uh, Kip and I, uh, he's, his birthday's on the 6th. I'm on the 9th. So on the 7th, we're going to go have dinner at Mohegan Sun. And then on the 8th, we're going to go out in his boat. And then on the 9th, uh, my ex-girlfriend's children who are now post-college age said, Hey, we want to make you a birthday cake. So I'm going to Cambridge to get a birthday cake from them. Oh, nice. Well, happy pre-birthday for you and Thank well, you. Now, do you have any advice um, for the fighters before we conclude our interview? Advice for the fighters, yeah. Uh, listen to your coach. That's it. Back <laughs> in the day, I had to figure everything out because there weren't any coaches. But now there's YouTube, and half the knucklehead kids at my gym spend half their time on YouTube trying to learn some cool new jump spinning hammer fist that they can do the gsp did once on a tape but actually never tried in real life we're in a different age now there are an enormous number of competent coaches including a large number we're blessed to have here in massachusetts so my advice to fighters is listen to your damn coach thank you very much and it means a lot to me that you took time to um to share your knowledge. And also your your book is What Not To Do, The Fighter's Book? Yes. <laughs> an X to every technique in there. So the now Fighters they have visuals. Book of what not to do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope we can do it again before too long. Yes, we will. Once um, everything gets back, then you can give us your view on how it felt being out of the scene and back to the scene. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Bye.